Tradcast Express. Tradcast Express, it's Friday, December 8th, 2023. Happy Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You know who's not that into the feast or the dogma? You guessed it. Jorge Bergoglio, also known as Pope Francis. Yes, Bergoglio has said a number of beautiful things about Our Lady in the last ten and a half years, and even affirmed the times that she was conceived without stain of original sin. One can certainly find quotes of him to that effect, and the Novus Ordo apologists will surely do precisely that. However, and this is a big however, Francis has also said things attacking and undermining the dogma over the years, and some of those we will look at now. In his Wednesday audience of September 11, 2013, Francis gave a so-called catechesis on the Church as mother of all Christians, and he managed to insult both the Church, who is the Immaculate Bride of Christ, and the Virgin Mary, our Lord's Immaculate Mother, both at the same time. Quote, The Church and the Virgin Mary are mothers, both of them. What is said of the Church can be said also of Our Lady, and what is said of Our Lady can also be said of the Church. Unquote. That's what Francis said, and so far so good. But a little further on, he says, quote, Do we love the Church as we love our mothers, also taking into account her defects? All mothers have defects. We all have defects. But when we speak of our mother's defects, we gloss over them. We love her as she is. And the church also has her defects. But we love her just as a mother. Do we help her to be more beautiful, more authentic, more in harmony with the Lord? Unquote. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out here what he's saying about the Blessed Virgin Mary. The fact that he says it about the church is also a blasphemy, since the church is the Immaculate Bride of Christ. For example, in his encyclical Divini Ilius Magistri, paragraph 101, Pope Pius XI speaks of the church as, quote, the mystical body of Christ, the Immaculate Spouse of Christ, and consequently a most admirable mother and an incomparable and perfect teacher, unquote. So, instead of drawing a beautiful analogy with the Blessed Virgin Mary to explain how the Catholic Church is likewise spotless and untainted, Bergoglio instead accuses the Bride of Christ of being sullied with defects or flaws, and having pointed out that what can be said about the Church can equally be said about the Virgin Mary, makes people draw the necessary conclusion that just as the Church has flaws, so does the Blessed Mother. That was in September of 2013. But Francis wasn't done for the year yet. In a homily given on December 20th, 2013, he said the following about the Blessed Mother at the foot of Calvary. Quote, The gospel does not tell us anything, if she spoke a word or not. She was silent, but in her heart, how many things she told the Lord. You, that day, this and the other that we read, you had told me that he would be great. You had told me that you would have given him the throne of David, his forefather, that he would have reigned forever, and now I see him there. Our lady was human. And perhaps she even had the desire to say, lies, I was deceived. John Paul II would say this, speaking about Our Lady in that moment. But she, with her silence, hid the mystery that she did not understand, and with this silence allowed for this mystery to grow and blossom in hope. Unquote. What revolting blasphemy! This quote was reported by Vatican Radio, by the way, and can still be found on their archived website. When it came time for inclusion in the Vatican's newspaper Osservatore Romano, and on the Vatican website, however, the line about lies, I was deceived, was omitted. Looks like someone in the Vatican was paying attention and knew that that wasn't exactly orthodox. By the way, you can find all the documentation, the web links for all of this, in the show notes. 
Next, let's fast forward to December 21st, 2018. In his annual Christmas greetings to the employees of the Unholy See and Vatican City State, Francis opined that the Virgin Mary, along with St. Joseph, was not a saint from the very beginning, but had to labor and toil to become holy. Quote, Our Lady and St. Joseph are full of joy. They look at the child Jesus and they are happy because, after a thousand worries, they have accepted this gift of God with so much faith and so much love. They are overflowing with holiness and therefore with joy. And you will tell me, of course, they are Our Lady and St. Joseph. Yes, but let us not think it was easy for them. Saints are not born, they become thus, and this is true for them, too. Unquote. So, Francis makes it seem as if the Blessed Mother, and we'll leave St. Joseph out of this discussion here because the Virgin Mary's holiness is unique, as if the Blessed Mother had to fight within herself to finally accept that Christ would be born of her. What blasphemous nonsense! The Blessed Mother, we know, immediately consented to the Incarnation as soon as the angel had assured her that what was being asked of her was not contrary to her vow of virginity. Luke one thirty eight says, quote, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. Unquote. The Blessed Mother was not only born a saint, by the way, she was conceived one. And that is dogma, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The devil never had any dominion over her, not for one instant. Our last example is uh, dated December 22nd, 2022. During his Christmas address to Vatican employees last year, the false pope claimed that the mother of God suffered labor pains, the pains of childbirth. Here's what he said. Quote, Serenity does not mean that everything is going well, that there are no problems, difficulties. No, this is not what it means. The Holy Family of Jesus, Joseph, and Mary shows us this. We can imagine when they reached Bethlehem, Our Lady was beginning to feel some pain. Joseph did not know where to go. He knocked on many doors, but there was no room. Unquote. Now, that is not a direct or explicit denial of the Immaculate Conception, but it is an indirect one. It's one that is implied. In other words, it undermines the dogma because pain in childbirth is one of the punishments for original sin. In Genesis chapter 3, God announces the punishment for their sin to Adam and Eve. And in verse 16, God says in particular to Eve, Quote, I will multiply thy sorrows and thy conceptions. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thou shalt be under thy husband's power, and he shall have dominion over thee. Unquote. In his apostolic constitution, Munificentissimus Deus, Pope Pius XII approvingly quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, who taught about the Blessed Virgin Mary that, quote, she was exempted from the fourfold curse that had been laid upon Eve, unquote. So, you see, Bergoglio is a shrewd fellow. He won't come out and say plainly, no, the Blessed Mother was not conceived immaculately. That would never fly. So he does it indirectly, implicitly, so as to weaken people's belief in the dogma one little bit at a time. Nor will it do to point out that Bergoglio has clearly affirmed the dogma on other occasions, that has long been a strategy employed by innovators to escape condemnation. In his bull Auctorem Fide, issued in 1794, Pope Pius VI condemned the, quote, erroneous pretext that the seemingly shocking affirmations in one place are further developed along orthodox lines in other places, and even in yet other places corrected, as if allowing for the possibility of either affirming or denying the statement, or of leaving it up to the personal inclinations of the individual. Such has always been the fraudulent and daring method used by innovators to establish error. It allows for both the possibility of promoting error and of excusing it." Unquote. 
Someone who affirms a dogma on some occasions and denies it on others is still a heretic. He's not half and half. There is no such thing, after all, as half a heretic and half a Catholic. Because he has an obligation to refrain from denying the dogma at any time. It's not good enough to affirm it only sometimes while denying it at other times. That's only reasonable. A man who is unfaithful to his wife is an adulterer. He doesn't become less of an adulterer simply because he commits adultery only once a month and has relations with his lawful wife on the other days. Such a man is an adulterer, and he is not faithful to his wife at all. He's not simply somewhat unfaithful and mostly faithful. He is not faithful. Similarly, if I agree that 2 plus 2 equals 4 sometimes, but not all the time, for example, depending on how I feel or what day of the week it is, then am I really affirming the truth of mathematics? Am I affirming the true meaning of 2 and plus and equals and 4? Of course not. A heretic is a heretic not because he always denies a dogma necessarily, but because he denies it at any point. It would be very easy for any heretic to escape the charge of heresy if only he could sometimes affirm what he at other times denies. Now, of course, a heretic can also cease to be a heretic, namely when he repents of and recants his heresy and professes the true faith, but that's clearly not the case here with Bergoglio. In other news, I want to mention very briefly that the latest post up on Novels Auto Watch as of the making of this podcast is Too Traditional for Tradition, Peter Kwasniewski versus Pope St. Pius X. A lot of people may not be aware, but in his efforts to rethink the papacy, the popular recognize and resist academic Peter Kwasniewski is moving further and further away from the pre-Vatican II magisterium. In our article, we present evidence from his online posts and essays that in recent years, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski has accused Pope St. Pius X of, get this, liturgical modernism. He's called St. Pius X's teaching on devotion and submission to the Pope a painful historical embarrassment. He's referred to St. Pius X's revisions to the Divine Office as impious and absurd, and has most recently shared and praised a quote from an English priest from a hundred years ago who referred to Pope Pius X as an Italian lunatic. You can't make the stuff up. Now, I mention this article not only because it's new and important, but also because I just had to issue a retraction of sorts regarding the claim that I make in the article that Peter Kwasniewski has never had an official teaching mandate from what he recognizes to be the lawful ecclesiastical authority. Apparently, that is not true. In other words, he does, or at least did, have that mandate when he taught at Wyoming Catholic College and uh, also in Austria. Kwasniewski himself contacted Novos Ordo Watch to set the record straight on that, and I have added a correction and apology concerning that at the top of this article. Hey, fair play is essential. This is a tough battle, and we can fight hard and be polemical, but what we cannot ever do is use lies or falsehood in the service of truth. So I have no problem issuing that correction. Oh, and one last thing, hot off the presses before we leave. The Austrian theologian Andreas Batlog has written an article in the weekly paper Die Furche, The Furrow, in which he argues that the Feast of the Immaculate Conception should be renamed into the Feast of Mary's Election, celebrating, in other words, that the Virgin Mary was specially chosen by God. Batlog contends that contemporary man is prone to misunderstand such terms as original sin and being immaculate from conception, it makes it sound, he says, as if, as if sexuality were a dirty thing. So, what's his solution? Well, instead of properly teaching the people with sound catechesis, the Jesuit theologian, yes, he's a Jesuit, of course, 
wants to change the language of the dogma. Well, he says language, but he actually wants to change what the Immaculate Conception is because he introduces different concepts. Batlock claims that the Feast of the Immaculate Conception celebrates Mary's election. Of course it does, but at the same time it is much more than that. Yes, Mary was specially chosen by God, but then so were Noah and Abraham and Moses and Samuel and St. John the Baptist and a lot of other people. Only a feast of the Immaculate Conception, not a feast of Mary's election, celebrates the fact that unlike any other mere creature, when Holy Mary was naturally conceived in the womb of St. Anne, the stain of original sin was miraculously not transmitted through the merits of the redemptive work that would be wrought by her divine Son, Jesus Christ. The Blessed Virgin Mary was entirely full of sanctifying grace from the very first moment of her existence, and that is expressed only by the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So, happy feast day. Tradcast Express is a production of Novus Ordo Watch. Check us out at tradcast.org, and if you like what we're doing, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at novusordowatch.org slash donate. Thank <laughs> you.